All right, let's come together on this. We're actually really sort of beginning to enter the last lap. I don't expect this to go any more than another 10 months. Um, we're in the middle, well not the middle, but we're in Galatians. And I'll open with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as always, we simply want to submit ourselves to the reign of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that as King, he may rule over us and direct us and protect us. And as Prophet, he may speak to us from the Word. And we look to your Holy Spirit to be the source of, of confirming that what's in front of us is the Word of God and that we can be trained in righteousness, in wisdom, in holiness, in love. And we ask you to be at work in our midst to that end. So bless your Word, we pray, as we consider it. For we ask this through Christ. Amen. Okay, we're in that little tricky spot in Galatians. Um, we'll go back for a moment to 3.10. Galatians 3.10, where the ESV says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. And I mentioned that for all who rely on works of the law, it's really for whoever from the works of the law are. That is, whoever is of the works of the law, which is worded in a way that parallels 3.7, know that it is those of faith, not, it doesn't say know that it is those who rely on faith, and 3.9, where it once again says those who are of faith. It doesn't say those who rely on faith. And doesn't 3.9 make sense as the ESV has translated it? those who are of faith. Does that make sense? Does that... So why when we get to 310, we insert, not we, but the translators insert the words rely on or trust in or, I think most of the English versions that I surveyed insert a word there. I don't know why they do. And by preserving the King James reading, uh, all who are of works of the law, we are basically maintaining the, the very intentional parallelism. There are two kinds of people here. There are the works of the law people and there are the uh, of faith people. And so there are the sons of Abraham who are characterized by ek pisteos. They are characterized by being of or from faith. And there are the erstwhile sons of Abraham, that is his DNA descendants, who are characterized by ex ergon namu, that is they are from or under, they are of the works of the law which I take as a reference to Israel under the law. Now remember, we're, we've got in the back of our minds that 2, 15 through 16, we who were Jews by nature, we know that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, right? So that's kind of in the background. We Jews, at least we Jews who have come to faith in Christ, know this. And so Paul is driving 
a redemptive historical wedge between covenant administrations, right? So this doesn't follow is any Jewish people who live throughout the world since the first century, but in the moment, it's a commentary on God's redemptive plan, right? There is the works of the law phase, which involved the sons of Abraham, but that was preliminary and preparatory, bringing us to the age that we are in, the age of freedom in Christ. So, strictly speaking, for as many as are of the works of the law is the way to read that passage. Thank you, King James and probably New King James Version for getting that right and at least allowing us to make our own judgment on it. Um, and the other angle on this, and this is enormously important, is that for Paul, the eschatological age to come has arrived for the experiential reason that the Spirit has been given to Jews and Gentiles alike. So the argument in Galatians is historical and covenantal. Of course, it's theological, but it's historical and covenantal. And this makes all the difference in the world in how we read Galatians, and I think it helps us to read Galatians as Paul intended it. And so Peter's mistake was in the age of the Spirit, when Spirit-filled Peter ate with Spirit-filled Gentiles, sharing that wonderful common faith in Jesus Christ, to divert from that under peer pressure and return in some ways to the, the division that God himself created is to attack the truth of the gospel, right? So it's, it would be hard in a sense to reduce truth of the gospel there to simply justification by faith. Um, and if it is simply justification by faith, it's a little bit difficult, and, and I know people could argue back and say, no, it isn't, but it seems a little difficult to me to see the enormity of Peter's error and why he needed, needs to be, why he's a hypocrite, why he's condemned, and why Paul had to confront him to his face. Okay. So, from the point of view of Galatians, the Mosaic Law in, was intended, certainly in part anyway, to preserve Abram's seed from Genesis 12, 1 through 3, until the fullness of time when Genesis 12, 3, where, where Paul says the gospel was preached to Abraham ahead of time, would be fulfilled, okay? That's, that's a, a dense argument, but it's an accurate historical argument that does justice to the whole argument of Galatians, especially as we get into four, five, and six where the spirit comes into his own. Uh, this is the age of the spirit, and now Paul wants to deal with that. Um, because the Galatians are biting and devouring one another as a result of the Judaizing influence there. Okay, So, with that in mind, we're going to skip Galatians 1.23 and go back to Galatians 2, 1 through 7, where our gospel words are used three times. Then, says Paul, he's reflecting on his career, which began, as we know from the book of Acts, with a direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul insists that his apostleship 
is as legitimate and as authoritative as any other apostleship because it pleased God to reveal his son in me or to me. Okay, so that's important in Galatians. There's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is like Rome and um, Constantinople and what other great centers? Canterbury, right? Centers of the Christian religion. All of that and more. And that's where the big guys are. Tulsa, yeah, Tulsa, of course, Tulsa. Horsham for the OPC. Does anyone even know where Horsham is? You would, yeah. Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, so whatever you're, this is like, and in a sense, that's understandable if you have the Old Testament. These are the men who walked with Jesus, and they are at the center of the Jewish world. Okay, so this allows the critics to sort of worm their way in and raise questions about Paul's authority. Did he walk with Jesus? Was he with Jesus for, th was he there on the night Jesus was betrayed? No, he's kind of a Paulie come lately, right? Um, well, Paul says, hey, not a chance. I had an encounter with Jesus. I didn't learn my gospel from any human beings. So I'm not reliant on anyone. So, you know, his relative humility in 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about being the last one, uh, is now balanced when he has to flex his muscles a little bit because maybe he's kind of a second level apostle. And Paul says, not a chance. In fact, and now we'll get into the text, then after 14 years, I am on, yeah. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, I set before them privately the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. And there's one of our gospel words. In order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. What's slavery here? I think so. It's a return to some lifestyle that's characteristic of um, faithful Judaism under the law. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that, and here's that phrase again, the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So apparently, I mean, this is a little bit of palace intrigue, right? Paul is going up to talk to the, the big wigs in Jerusalem, and there are people in the orbit of the big wigs who have an agenda and are sort of, you know, they're wiretapping the meeting to find out what's going on, and they want to somehow interfere with the Pauline Gentile mission, evidenced by apparently some level of pressure put on Paul to make sure Titus was circumcised. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, 
when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel, third use, to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. Now, there, there are backstories here that we sort of have to recreate from the text itself, and I think we can do a relatively credible job doing that. But if you come to this passage without the preconceived idea that Paul is arguing for justification by faith alone and for a Torah-free gospel, um, sorry, I wrote this a couple of weeks ago. Let me rephrase that. If you listen to that passage without, that's what I should have said, the preconceived idea that Paul is arguing for justification by faith alone and for a Torah-free gospel for the Gentiles, then you can hear it, that there's more going on here than the narrower debate about how people are saved. So we might regard this passage as less an obligation as if, P, as if Paul needed some type of apostolic imprimatur, and it's more of a courtesy, right? So Paul's not going up there because he regards himself as obligated to submit himself to the counsel of the original apostles. He doesn't need that, but he does it anyway and somehow in all of this, he's retelling this story to clear things up with the Galatians themselves. So word is out about Paul and there are slanders involved. So Paul's simply setting the record straight. And he's on the one hand being respectful and yet he's making these little side comments that suggest uh, being respectful is one thing but I'm really not reliant on anyone else to instruct me in the gospel. You can't say that, Rich, and I can't say that, and George can't say that, but the Apostle Paul can say that because he had this encounter with the risen Christ and God had set Paul apart from the womb to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. So he's an extraordinary individual. Okay, so. Uh, I'm trying to figure out why I have it written this way. Mm, yeah, Paul, I like this line. It, it's more, Paul is more curt than courteous. Uh, I'm trying to figure out why I did what I did here. Because I say to myself, let's look at 1, 4 through 5 before we revisit the Antioch controversy. Ah, uh, I must have meant 2, 4 through 5. So, false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And so now rereading what we read earlier, we've got this idea that the truth of the gospel is at stake. No one's going to circumcise Titus because the truth of the gospel is at stake. No one needs to tell me what the gospel is, but I will submit to my brothers and allow them to evaluate my work, but it's not like they're my superiors. But what's at stake here is the truth of the gospel being preserved for you. Now I take the you there to be the Galatians, but by extension, the Gentiles. 
Now on to Antioch and Peter's departure from the truth of the gospel. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, and James is one of the pillars in Jerusalem, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, same phrase, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, lived like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to Judaize, that is, to live like Jews? So, in order to make sense of all of this, the church relied on, the Christian church, historically, relied on what has come to be known as the ceremonial law. That is, there are three parts to the Mosaic law. There's a moral core. There is the judicial law, which is not quite exclusively for Israel, but mostly our confession allows a loophole there that people drive Mack trucks through in order to resurrect even the judicial law, and then the ceremonial law. Um, and now it's that ceremonial law that speaks to this crisis. Okay, now, I, I don't think there is a ceremonial law. I think there's the law. And it includes commandments that have an enduring character that are true always and everywhere. But they became especially true covenantally in Israel under the law. Judicial laws, most Christians take it for granted that we don't even try to have the authorities implement the judicial law, right? If you ever look at the judicial law, you can't imagine a, a free Western democratic society implementing it. And then, of course, there are the ceremonies. Now, there's actually nothing inherently um, disparaging about the word ceremony or ceremonial, right? But as it came to be used, especially in Protestant Catholic debates, you, you can pick up a little bit a dismissiveness about ceremonies as if they were merely superficial expressions of a works religion. And obviously, so we say, that was done away with completely because it's been fulfilled in the work of Christ. So the ceremonial law now becomes that thing which the Judaizers were trying to resurrect and implement in the Gentile churches. Does this sound familiar? And circumcision is a ceremony. If you actually read about circumcision both in the Bible and in um, extra biblical literature, it doesn't come off as a ceremony any more than we would think of baptism as a ceremony. It's a bloody initiation into the covenant community. And Moses found out that when you don't circumcise your son, God comes after you, which seems to me to be more than uh, a ceremonial faux pas, right? 
It's only his wife who circumcises their son and basically keeps God's wrath away from their family. So it's that nagging ceremonial law that keeps opposing justification by faith alone. But the whole argument, I think, is a misunderstanding of the role of law and works in the book of Galatians. In fairness to the Reformation, I think they got all the answers right, even if they didn't quite get the math right. You read Galatians and you read the story of Jesus in the Gospels, and you're basically looking at the first century version of the papacy. And that's how he saw it, and as did other reformers. So you see the hierarchy. The officers, whether they be the Pharisees and Sadducees or the cardinals, the pope, and the bishops. You see all the, the efforts to invent ways of having your sins forgiven and the, the methodologies, and it just seemed to line up point by point. So, when you read Luther, and he's a wonderful read, his book on his commentary in Galatians is superb. It was just easy to see that Roman Catholicism with its villains was really just an updated group of Pharisees as the original villains in the gospel. And the whole papal hierarchy with its uh, interest in money and all the rest it just so what could be more obvious than from galatians works versus faith and at the level of substance luther was right it is a faith versus works controversy but they didn't quite get the meaning of works in galatians and how the argument is a historical argument and not, not a conflict between whether we should observe ceremonies or not. Does that make sense? It can be a little difficult to work this through, especially if you've been trained for all of your years and years and years in the world, and there are a few of us who have had years and years and years in the world, to see it as a ceremonial law versus faith in Jesus Christ. I like to point out that um, in the chapter on Christian liberty in the Westminster Confession, it says we are freed from the yoke of the ceremonial law. What's that a reference to? That's, that's biblical language but it's biblical language that's been fiddled with. Anyone know? Yes, and I think that's that is an intentional reference to the yoke. Yoke appears in Galatians, right? But it also appears in Acts 15. Um, the apostles, they were gathered together and Peter stood up, Peter of all people, <laughs> considering what happened in Galatia or what happened in Antioch, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. This sounds like a commentary on Galatians. Now, therefore... Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus 
just as they will. So what is the yoke that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Verse 3. Well, let's read verses 1 through 3. But some men came down from Judea. Judea is kind of a problem, isn't it? People keep coming down there and causing trouble. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So this reinforces a little bit that the issue in Galatia is circumcision. Though that argument doesn't make a lot of sense as if just getting circumcised would somehow uh, fit the bill. But there's commentary on that. After that, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, some people say this is Acts or Galatians 2. Others don't think so, and there's never been a consensus on Galatians 2 in the Acts historical framework. But when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers, apparently they're Christians, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Okay, so it's not circumcision in the abstract that's the issue. It's circumcision as the entry right for law keeping. And Peter's argument is in effect, did that ever work for us? Does anyone remember the exile? Does anyone remember the prophets? Does any, anyone remember how in story after story in the Bible, bad kings brought lawlessness and curse upon the people? We don't have a great history here. So why at this stage in redemption, after the people of God received the Spirit, just as we did on the day of Pentecost. Right, he's talking about um, Cornelius and his household. Why, after all of this, would we now turn around and say, okay, let's, let's dust off the law of Moses and make that our rule for living? That's what's going on, I think, in Galatians. So Luther was right on the substance. The mistake is found in the way we've read Paul's redemptive historical contrast. It's between two covenants. We tried to cover this in the Galatians Bible study. Maybe that's on tape if you're interested. Um, but I think largely this is the right way to read Galatians, and it makes the most sense of the letter. Now, I have a couple of more things to say about Galatians, but does anyone want to ask a question at this point? Yeah. Not quite getting the story right, or are they out people who are under the influence of Satan who are infiltrating the church? It's quite different. It really is. And it seems like it would be the same people. It seems like he's talking about the same argument here in both places. Yeah. That's a, that's a, I think that's a very insightful point. We might ask, are they exactly the same people? Could it be possible in a bigger conversation 
that the Acts 15 people are authentic and well-intentioned, but just wrong. And then there's the Galatians 2 people who are motivated with sinister motives and satanic. Or could they be the same people and Luke is being charitable and Paul, who's given to polemics, is being uh, Luther-like and a bit nasty. Right. Yeah. I, I think one thing that might help make that um, distinction clearer is spending 40 years in the church where you realize there are misguided people who've carried over who knows what kind of superstition or belief into their Christian faith, but are genuinely Christian, and people who are intentionally troublemakers. And I, I think in my experience, I could say I've seen both. Um, there's that, we looked at this in the, past, in the pastoral epistle study, and I can't remember off the top of my head where it is, but Paul tells, I believe it's Timothy, that if, there, if there's a divisive person in the congregation, warn him once or twice and then kick him out. And Presbyterians can't do that. And it makes me think, why not? Presbyterians would then enter into a 12-year phase of judicial review uh, through all the courts of the church, and then we might kick him out. And Paul's more interested in preserving what's actually happening in local churches and the terrible damage that even one individual can do to the people of God in a local community. And remember, these communities are not 10,000 member megachurches. They're 60, 70 people tops. Uh, and Paul says, you know what? Tell them to hit the road. Just get them out. And that strikes me as a kind of efficiency that Presbyterians and other church governments might step away from, but we've got Paul telling us this. I've been to general assemblies when I used to go to them where the court cases, I might have said this before, the court cases that would come before us, you're sitting there going, are we, are we really dealing with this guy? He's an idiot. Sorry, bleep that out. I'm not allowed to say that. But you know, we had a guy who, he was just a pain in the neck. And now he's got the entire representative body of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church listening to his case because he did something kind of nasty to some kids in the church. And I remember someone making a speech. Not everybody is crazy, right? Someone said, we're, what we're basically doing is we're discrediting the local pastor and the session and their judgment on the scene. They know this guy, and we're giving him the run of the place. And it was just like if, if we had allowed someone to say, you know, the Assemblies of God Church would be just a perfect fit for you. And I know the pastor, why don't you try to go over there? So there's an efficiency, I think, in Paul that relies on a local wisdom and insight. And can anyone tell me where there is judicial review in the New Testament? I'm not saying that cynically. I, that's very much a part of Presbyterianism, and you can see the wisdom in it, 
because there are people in local churches who, who get run out because sessions can be mean-spirited and selfish and don't like troublemakers who really aren't causing trouble. But at the same time, I'm not sure that you know, this vast hierarchy and the, the, the Kafkaesque tunnels of judicial review are always the wisest course. I think part of, part of it is um, they take Acts 15 as normative, that there is this thing called the General Assembly. So Acts 15 isn't a peculiar one-off event. You know, there were elders there, that's true, uh, not just apostles. And so now it's annual, and they're very concerned, probably for reasons traceable back to our European history, for the rights of the accused, which is, which is honorable in itself. But a big part of our book is how do you run a trial? Yeah. yeah. It, it, we're, doing, we're doing the best we can. Even Ed Eppinger um, conceded. The Ep Eppinger was, Ed Eppinger was a, a, an OP guy who was dedicated to interpreting the book. Yes, he was the default parliamentarian. Whenever we met, he said that our judicial system was based more on English common law than it was on the Bible. Yes, I, I agree. I think George makes a good point. It would be nice just to say that because we are concerned about the rights of the accused and we really don't trust local churches to do what's best. They're not always wise. Um, but nevertheless, we have to have some uh, way to, we have, there has to be apparatus in place to protect the rights of the accused and to um, allow for larger gatherings of TEs and REs to make judgments on local situations. <laughs> yeah, I know it. I've handed him over to Satan. <laughs> dunk, dunk, dunk. We find you guilty and we're handing you over to Satan. Yeah. Yep. Yes, I, I think that's a great point, Rich. It's easy for me to sort of, you know, with a little bit of detachment say, uh, look how we do things and are they biblical? Go to another church and see how they do things, and you may come running back to Presbyterianism uh, because of the consequences of what happens 
when you don't have an overseeing body. Yeah, uh, you know, and even the idea that we Presbyterians don't take things to the church if the word church means the people who are gathered. If there's something that has to be handled in a disciplinary sense, we protect the individual involved until a decision is made. So we don't just parade someone right before the congregation once, um, you know, George and Jean couldn't settle there, you know, so now we bring, everybody come sit down, here's George, here's Jean, they're going to, you tell us what you want us to do. <laughs> you know it. Yes. Yeah, I will. I would put a footnote on that. This brings into sharper relief how much time the apostles spend saying, "Just give everybody a break." Don't treat everything like it's a judicial controversy, right? Peter says, love covers a multitude of sins. So the whole idea is, if it's gotten to the point where there has to be any type of formal sessional investment, there have been all sorts of failures along the way, or at least highly likely, because you're all looking out for your rights. And that's what you find in judicial cases, that when it comes to me, the individual involved, I'm so offended and I'm so aggrieved that everybody needs to know about it. And an outside Christian observer might go, couldn't you just, you know, let that go? What's at stake here? This will be the end of all things. John Adams. Yeah, I think so. And when, and I'm not using the, the word legalistic in the typical pejorative sense, but when churches are legal oriented, then the possibility of some type of judicial investigation and judgment uh, were litigious in the Presbyterian church. And we look at the courts as sort of the first way to resolve a dispute instead of a last resort. Not everybody, of course. This is a, but we have a, a law mindset in Presbyterianism. All right, let's get ready for worship.